Good morning. It is October 27, and uh, we are in about our third or fourth week of Devarim, which is Deuteronomy. Devarim meaning words, and we're in chapter 4 today. All right. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel before they cross the Jordan River. Begins now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live. This kind of sounds familiar. Sounds like the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Uh, it's very similar. And he says, go in and possess the land, but don't add to this word, neither take away from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh Eloheka, <clears throat> the Lord your God, which I command you. This sounds similar to Revelation 22, 18. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in his book. Don't take away, don't add. If we're to believe that God really meant the above statement, why have we stopped obeying so many commands such as remember the Sabbath day and observe my feast days? You really have to buy into replacement theology to say that these commands of God were only intended for the Jewish race and that we are not under any expectation from God to obey any of his commands because Jesus has totally forgiven us for any willful violation of God's laws. This theology sort of says that we only really need forgiveness for those things that we really feel guilty about. And nobody's going to feel guilty about breaking laws that virtually everybody is breaking, including the leaders of the church. This is what we've inherited. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, remember that was that very wicked, sinful uh, idol worship that involved all kind of degradation. Uh, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. Sin with the Moabites. That's what that was. Phineas and the plague. Remember all that. But ye that did cleave unto Yahweh, Eloheka, are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh, Elohe, commanded me that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Now that they know the statutes, they are now prepared to go in to possess the land. There had to be a weeding out of those that would not abide by his statutes and judgments. And that's what, that's what the Father did with the children of Israel, preparing them to go into the promised land. Jesus tells the children of Israel, therefore keep and do them, do these laws, keep them. That this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. What which shall hear all these statutes and say, so your nation will get a reputation. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great? Who hath Elohim so nigh unto them as Yahweh el is in all things that we call upon him for? Wouldn't it be great that if America had that reputation that other nations said, is there another nation, any other nation so great because their God is so great and the people follow their God? Um, and this, incidentally, can apply to your personal life. The way Yahweh our Elohim is near us whenever we pray to him. Is that uh, the reputation that we have in our praying? That when we pray, our God is near us when we call upon him. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgment so righteous in all this law which I set before you this day? America began with righteous laws. We talk about the... Uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic, but um, we've allowed a lot of laws to creep into our nation which are not righteous laws and things that are just very degrading to uh, men and women together. And so uh, say nothing further lest I be flagged. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Sounds like the law is a precious treasure to be cherished. And that's the way I'm looking at it. But what does it mean to keep thy soul diligently? What does that mean? Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, 
but teach them to your sons and to your sons' sons. Let's talk a minute about what it means to keep your heart in all diligence. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with all diligence. That sounds similar. For from it flow springs of life. Philippians 2.12, therefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Working out your salvation, fear and trembling, guarding your heart with diligence. There's an awful lot that we need to do in living out and experiencing fully the salvation that we have in Yahushua Mashiach, Jesus the Christ. There is certainly an aspect of self-discipline in your keeping your soul diligently. Self-discipline is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Too many professing Christians, too many professing Christians want to believe or even teach that since Jesus did all the saving work on the cross, which we could not do, and that salvation is a free gift, then we don't have to do anything except think about all this in a certain way of positive acceptance giving the nod of agreement that it all happened just like the Bible says it did. I believe that he died on the cross and it all happened. There's more to it than just having between your ears a concept. We must surrender, take up your cross daily and follow him and keep your soul with all diligence. Well, you know something <clears throat> and believe it strongly enough you will teach it and pass it on to those who are closest to you. And that's what the scripture just said about teaching to your sons and your sons' sons. Remember and acknowledge all that Yahweh has done for you. That's what this means. Keep him uh, keep in, the, in the forefront of your gratitude. He's responsible for everything. Every good and perfect gift cometh from above. Don't let what you have seen and known depart from your heart. It's another way to keep your guard your heart diligently. Don't let things uh, that you've seen and known depart from you, especially, and I thought of this, young people, when you go off to college. That happens so often. You've got uh, young people that grew up in a Christian home, and the parents certainly want their children to guard their heart and not depart from what they've been taught. But that's what happens a lot when a a child is no longer under the parent's household and authority, and they're out on their own, and they got all these evil influences all around them, and they can drastically change their behavior and their allegiance. Recall his mighty acts over and over. That's what we do. And keeping the feasts is a way of doing that. It's a rehearsing over and over again, the bride preparing herself for the coming kingdom. And teach these things to your children and your grandchildren. And Moses continues saying, especially the day that thou stood before Yahweh. He's recounting, remember, when you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, Mount Sinai, when Yahweh said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. There you go. And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. This is the artist's rendering of Mount Sinai on fire. As the scripture says, the mountain was on fire. Very interesting that you can go to Google Maps. This is a picture of Jabba al-Laws, which we believe is the true Mount Sinai. And it is actually black. It's, it's, how did that mountain look at the top of that? How did all that get charred and black as opposed to all the rest of the mountains? Just saying. And Yahweh spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but you, you didn't see him with your eyes. You only heard the voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. And he gave you the ten words or the, the ten devarim. That's what this book is called. Ten, we call them commandments. Hadabarim, which means things. It can mean things or words. Dabar is singular. Dabarim is plural. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. You may say, but we weren't there to see the holy mountain on fire with the Spirit of God and the commandments being given to Moses, whose face shone brightly. But do you remember where you were when his Holy Spirit came upon you and entered your very soul and burned within you a desire to follow him all your days? 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you became the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. And Yahweh commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them. He keeps talking about don't just teach them and learn about them. He says that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed of, unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude. Again, he says you didn't see God's face. You didn't see him on the day Yahweh spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of fire. On the day he spoke to you from the heart of the fire at Mount Sinai unto you. Yahweh did not just speak to Moses alone. He's reminding them that God spoke to them. He spoke to the people. Of course, the question is, has he spoken to you? He continues to speak to us, doesn't he? Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of a male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, such as maybe a calf. That's what they did. Their, their forefathers did. This is the next generation. All those that did that with a calf have died out in the wilderness. The likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. That's why God only let them hear his voice and not see some image of him, lest they would make an ideal, an, an idol image out of what they saw. See, because that's what the Egyptians did in other pagan cultures and nations. They made idols out of things that they saw on the earth. They worshiped the creation rather than the creator. And lest thou lift up thine eyes to heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and stars, and even all the hosts of heaven, should be striven to worship them. So, and some cultures have done that as well. And serve them, which the, which the Lord your God hath divided unto all the nations, unto the whole heaven. But Yahweh hath taken you and bought, brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Kind of like comparing that mountain is on fire with, with I mean, like the fiery furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived, and he will bring you through the fire. Uh, this is definitely not the way that I would make a sign. I've seen this before. You probably have too. I just recreated this where due to lack of letters, say sun worship, 11 o'clock. No, we're not worshiping the sun. I know what they meant by that, but I still wouldn't put that as my sign. Furthermore, Yahweh was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over Jordan, that I should not go into that. You know, he says, because of you. Even Moses can't resist assigning blame or partial blame to others for his own disobedience and i'm like moses let it go he says this is why he was not allowed to go over jordan well actually he was not allowed to go over Jordan because he disobeyed when he struck the rock the second time and didn't just speak to it but yahweh el give gave you this land for an inheritance but he says i must die in this land i must not go over jordan but you shall go over and possess that good land take heed unto yourselves lest you forget the covenant of yahweh el which he made with you and make you a graven image. Don't do that. In the likeness of anything, don't do that. Which Yahweh el hath forbidden thee. For Yahweh el is a consuming fire. Even a jealous God. He is a jealous God. The sin of the golden calf stood out in Moses' mind over the past 40 years. As perhaps the most grievous sin of the children of Israel that they committed. But that generation has now died in the wilderness. But Moses wants to drill into Yah's people to not fall back into previous sin when they get into the promised land without him. Moses makes a prophetic declaration here. Verse 25, he says, When you, get, when you shall beget children and children's children, you shall have remained long in the land and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or the likeness of anything and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. He said, wow, it's Moses. You evidently have a, a clue that that might be what they will do. As much as Moses tries to warn the children of Israel to not fall into idolatry, he comes right out and predicts to them that they will do just that. But he prophesies that it won't happen until after they have been in the land a long time. But then he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land 
whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed, and Yahweh shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, where Yahweh shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, and neither which don't see or hear or eat or smell. So he's he's making a very sobering, dire prediction. Not only does Moses predict that they will fall into idolatry, he foresees that they will be utterly destroyed and lose the land. This is exactly what happened to them. I, I wonder if the people at the time felt like, oh, Moses, no, say it isn't so. We won't do that. But he was given insight, and it was for the purpose of warning them. And there were those that kept the faith. You know, there's always a remnant. There's always the faithful few. Jesus talked about the narrow way. Few be those that find it. But if from there you shall seek the Lord your God, then thou shalt find him. See, here's the, the remnant. If thou seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. See, Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. He's telling them there, there is opportunity for repentance when they fail. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if you turn to Yahweh Elaka, thou shalt be and shalt be obedient to his voice. See, it's turning and obeying. That's what he wants for us. For Yahweh el Heka is a merciful Elohim. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. But even beyond the prophecy that they will utterly fail, Moses offers the hope to us in the last days that Yah's mercy will allow for repentance and restoration if we become obedient. Remember those words, to obey is better than sacrifice. He wants our obedience obedient to hear his voice which includes what he has spoken in his Torah and it says he will not forsake thee neither destroy thee nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swore to them well, what did he swear to them what was his covenant his covenant was to make them a people to give them a land he would be their God and they would be in this incredible wonderful relationship was Yahweh's covenant with Abraham conditional or unconditional that covenant with Abraham it initially was a promise and it's an unconditional promise it it was a promise he made but along the way when there is falling away and sin he gives the condition if you will do this then I will do that but his covenant still stands and he's not finished he's not finished with us and that's why we pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven it hasn't happened yet it will it will for ask now of the days that are past which were before thee since the day that Elohim created man upon the earth and asked from the one side of heaven to the other whether there have been any such thing as this great thing or had been heard like it. Moses tells the people to consider their past, where they came from. They're the only people in all of history since creation that Elohim spoke to them and called them to be his people. Or hath Elohim essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand and a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all Yahweh Elohim did for you in Egypt before your eyes. No other people group has been selected to be a nation belonging to Elohim. Remember how you came out of Egypt by great miracles. It wasn't you know, that you know God is just a, um, a the, the conquering empirical God that just wants to uh, just conquer, conquer, conquer. He wants to draw a people that will be obedient and they will be a light to the other nations. Other nations will want to come and join them, just like many did coming out of Egypt. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth. What? How much better can it get? Which Yahweh Elohim giveth thee forever. 
That's what he wants for us. We, and what are his statutes? Here's one example speaking about the Feast of Passover. He says things like this. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. That's what he's telling us, to keep the feast. And that's what we're endeavoring to do the best we can. And it's for the purpose that everything will go well with us in our days upon this earth. He loves us that much. But this is just the beginning. There is an eternity out there. Notice that we're commanded to keep his statutes and obey his commandments for our benefit in this life here on earth. The point of these words is not to tell how to find eternal life. It's not. The Torah doesn't really teach how to find eternal life. It teaches how to live an obedient, abundant life here that's pleasing to the Father. It's to teach us how we can live in obedience to the Father. Yahweh has a great impact upon our hope for resurrection and viability in the last days. And that's why we heed these words. We want to prolong our days even in the midst of great trial and struggle. He will use us if our days are prolonged. We get to be used by him more and more to help win others to Christ. Eternity's out there. Yes, it's waiting. And that's a goal to see him face to face. But we're living in the here and now. What does he want us to do right now? Is the above promise by Yah still true? Or did Jesus nullify this word of the Father? Here's the theological dilemma. Yahusha, Jesus, made it possible for all of us who have not kept all of his statutes and commandments to be forgiven these sins and also inherit eternal life. But the church has said one, two, or all three of these statements. Number one, it's not a sin to ignore most of the Old Testament statutes as they are only for Jews. Well, if that is true, then why are we not trying our best to tell the Jews that they ought to stop sinning and keep their Old Testament statutes? Many Jews don't do that. If that's really what it's intended for them to please God, then we ought to be telling the Jews, oh, you people need to keep the laws. The answer is that the church says that most of those laws don't apply to anyone anymore except nine of the Ten Commandments. And they remember the Sabbath day is that fourth commandment that, well, we've skewed it a little bit. Number two, God no longer expects us to keep his statutes because it's not necessary anymore since our souls are not saved for eternity by our attempts to keep the statutes. So we're saved just by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast, right? But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's our worship of him. That's our response. And we will be judged according to what we have done, according to Revelation. The church might also say this. Besides, it does not matter if we don't keep the statutes, because Jesus' death on the cross forgave the world of its sin. But by definition, sin is the breaking of the law. That's what sin is, breaking of the Torah. So how do we... Um, keep the law by breaking the law. <laughs> you know, and it does matter. It does matter because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Here's my question. Why can't the church just say, yes, we are saved by grace when Jesus forgives our sins, but that's why we will keep his statutes to worship him in a way that pleases him because we love him and desire to fully obey him. Why can't we say that? The answer is that church is that the church wants to make it as easy as possible for people to join up and enroll, not emphasizing the cost of discipleship, which is our obedience. We tend to recruit others the way the Marines do. We're we're looking for a few good men. Look, you get education and great pension and get a load of this great uniform. They don't recruit soldiers by ads that say, come be a Marine. It will cost you everything, and basic training will almost kill you. But isn't that really what Jesus said? If any man will come after me, you must die to yourself, take up your cross. You will be persecuted. Many times we don't count the cost. And that's where I found this little song. It's by an Australian, because of the way you'll hear him pronounce count. Count the cost. Count the cost. I can't even say how he says it. Count the cost. Uh, I shortened it down to two minutes, 
But uh, thank you for joining me today. Count the cost of discipleship. Get ready to cross over in the promised land and live for him. See you, see you next week. I'm saying yes to you and no to my desires. I'll leave myself behind and follow you. I'll walk the narrow road because it leads me to you. I'll I've counted up the cost Oh, I've counted up the cost Yes, I've counted up the cost And you are worth it Counted up the cost. Oh, I've counted up the cost. Yes, I've counted up the cost, and you are worth it.